Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Michal McGrath. I'm from the Visible Thread team. I'm head of marketing here at Visible Thread. I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar with uh, Jennifer Swouse. Um, just a little bit about Visible Thread before we move forward. We are a language analysis platform. We support, we support many customers, such as on this screen, in terms of uh, complex documentation and how to improve business writing. Um, if anyone wants to learn more about Visible Thread, we're more than happy to help, as always. And we hope you really enjoy this webinar and you find it beneficial. Um, before I begin, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so first of all, we'd love to know if you're a long-term subscriber of Visible Thread, if you've attended webinars before, or you're a first timer. We do lots of these type of polls throughout the presentation. So feel free to click the slides. You can interact with the slides and start selecting um, whether you've seen our webinars before or if you've um, or if you're this is your first time. Um, a few little other housekeeping parts. We will send slides and recordings to you after the webinar, um, so all will be available. Um, if you do have questions for me or for Jennifer, please free to use the Q and A box on the screen. We will be doing a live Q and A session at the very end. We're happy to answer any questions, so feel free to, to put them through as you go on. Um, so it's great. We have loads of new people. So we have actually nearly 80% new, which is fab. Um, and then we have some long-term subscribers as well. So it's great to have new people on this webinar. If anybody wants more information about what we do or what Jennifer do, we'd be more happy to pass information. Um, since we have so many new people on the call, there is some major events happening with Visible Trade over the next couple of weeks and months. The biggest of which is certainly Optimize. Uh, Optimize Business Writing has well over 1,200 registrants at this point. It is a full day event of how to improve your business writing. So we'll be tackling everything from proposal writing to structure to storytelling to uh, how to create a good narrative and persona and writing for different personas and audiences. It's a superb event. It's full day. It's virtual and it's completely free. So. If you would like to sign up for that event or would like more information, please click the link on screen. It's completely free and it's on September 12th, so it's not too far away. Um, so we'd be delighted to see you there and you're more than welcome. And similarly, um, if you are in the DC area or would like to travel to DC to meet us in, per in person, we are running our summit, our annual summit, which we run every year um, in the DC area. It's gonna be in the Gaylord National Resort in National Harbor. We'd be delighted to meet you there. Um, this event is not just for customers, but it, it, it's for customers to meet their customer success managers, but it's also for the general audience to listen to best practice, to meet people in, the, in similar roles and professions and to network. Um, so it's a fabulous event. Again, it's free. It's a full day event in, on Wednesday, November 1st. Um, so if you would like details, please click the link and it'll open in a new tab for you to select. Um, so what I'd like you to do if you haven't done already is please subscribe to Jennifer Spouse's newsletter. Um, I found Jennifer on LinkedIn. I was aware of her work in the previous, but once I subscribed to her newsletter over the last couple of months, I see all the fantastic um, communications and presentations that she's provided and she provides regularly to her audience. Um, really detailed, very, very transparent information in great formats such as YouTube and, and other webinars such as this. So please do subscribe. Jennifer is based in the Washington DC area, 20 years of experience. Jennifer and her team consult established companies in the federal sector, primarily on the GSA uh, schedule. And it's a perfect format for today because this, this is the topic to dig into the GSA schedule and make it work for you. Um, so please subscribe. If you're not a subscriber, so loads of you haven't subscribed yet. A couple of people that you know already, Jennifer, which is great. Um, but please do, please do get involved. And Jennifer creates some great content for her subscribers. So please, please do connect there. Now, without further ado, Jennifer, how are you today? Great. Thanks so much again to our friends at Visible Thread. And thanks to everyone who's taken time out of their day to join us live or anyone that's tuning in for the recording. Uh, again, Jennifer Schaus coming to you live today from Washington, D.C. And we're talking about the GSA schedule and leveraging it as a federal business development tool. Um, I'm going to go through just um, 
a, a quick agenda here. I'll tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we'll talk about some basics of federal contracting, uh, a little bit about what a GSA schedule is for those that maybe are scratching their head and considering using this as a tool. Um, we'll dig into some of the details and then I'll make some concluding remarks. For anyone that has questions, I believe there is a chat box on your right hand side. You can type your questions in and then they will be read off um, in the order that they're received as we get to the uh, end of the presentation today. So again, about us, uh, we are based in downtown Washington, DC, and uh, I've got over 20 years of experience. I started my career with Dun & Bradstreet, writing credit reports on companies, and then we began selling that data to uh, federal government departments and agencies. They used that data for two reasons. Number one was for uh, investigative reasons. So the CIA, uh, NSA, uh, segments of Department of Justice and DOD, uh, would be investigating contractors, OIG offices, uh, but then the the other half of the use for the Dun & Bradstreet data was to uh, evaluate potential contractors on their financial stability. Did these companies have the financial wherewithal to maintain the terms and conditions of contracts? Um, the reason I talk about Dun & Bradstreet, uh, obviously I started my career there and that was my foray into federal contracting. Uh, but during my time there, we were a fairly small office of about 10 people. And during that time, we pursued the GSA schedule. Uh, and this is the most important part of what I'm going to say is because some of our customers were asking us to get onto the schedule because it helped to facilitate the purchasing process. Um, so back to me and my firm and where I am today, uh, with 20 years of experience, we do work with established government contractors, a lot of large businesses, publicly traded firms, Chevron, Amoresco, Invisalign, Segway, um, and others, and basically help them navigate the federal market. Uh, our main offering is helping companies with the GSA schedule and other contract vehicles. Some of the other services uh, that we provide are listed there on the screen. Uh, over the course of these 20 years, we've amassed a library of over 600 plus, I think we're up to 630, I think today might actually make 630 uh, government contracting webinars, which will be available to you complimentary. Um, if you hop over to our YouTube channel, you can subscribe for free, there's no cost, and you'll be alerted anytime there is a new webinar that is uploaded. We also put on conferences and events and webinars for government contractors, and our newsletter now reaches close to 27,000 subscribers, most of which are federal contractors. So in the event that your business is uh, targeting federal contractors, you can advertise in our newsletter and in our webinar series. Send us a, an email to the hello at jenniferschaus.com and we'll send you a media kit. Okay, so let's just um, dig in at a, at a high level and a very uh, elementary level here to federal contracting for anyone that is new to the market. Um, the U.S. federal government is the world's largest purchaser. They're spending billions of dollars every fiscal year. The fiscal year runs October 1st through September 30th, so we're coming up on the tail end. We've got a couple weeks left uh, before the fiscal year is over, and the government has more or less a use it or lose it policy. Uh, a lot of times during Q4, the government will, uh, you'll see spikes in spending, particularly through contract vehicles, because they help facilitate the procurement process. They make it easier uh, for the government to get to you if in fact you are on a contract vehicle. Um, this market is also so unique, uh, and by this market I mean the federal market, um, as well as state, local, and education, simply because uh, there is so much publicly available data that's available to you as long as you have an internet connection. So by using the data that's out there, you can uh, determine how to spend your time, where to spend your time and effort, and you can be more effective and efficient, which will make you a more successful contractor. So the more time that you spend up front on the research, the uh, that's really where you should be spending the bulk of your time, um, as well as relationship building, but you need to have that piece in play first before you start executing anything. If you're just looking at SAM.gov and responding to RFPs and RFQs, that's really a knee-jerk reaction. Um, you need to be proactive and not reactive. So use the data that's available to you. Uh, 
um, federal government departments are also required to post their acquisition forecast, which is a list of what they are getting ready to purchase for the next fiscal year. It's usually in the format of a spreadsheet, um, and you'll have various columns, a point of contact, sometimes a phone number and an email address, what quarter the purchase is going to take place in, uh, the mechanism by which the government will purchase, meaning is it set aside for an 8A, is it women-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, some other uh, designation, is it going through a contract vehicle, meaning GSA schedule or some other contract vehicle, uh, and then it'll give you the quarter, uh, typically, if it's that detailed, and some of these are, um, but some departments and agencies do a better job than others. Um, you also need to know the rules of the game for federal contracting. That's the FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulations. Uh, there's 52 parts in the FAR, 52 weeks in a year in 2020. We covered all 52 parts of the FAR. Uh, and you can hop over to our YouTube channel, uh, or I'm sorry, to our website, which will then take you to our YouTube channel for each of those parts. Uh, but it's important to understand how the government conducts, uh, for example, market research, and that's one of the parts of the FAR. How are they looking for businesses? And then you can reverse engineer more or less to, um, to make sure that your business is going to be found in one of those uh, areas or in one of those manners that the government is searching. Um, at the end of the day, all of those things are, are, are equal. Um, all companies are, are playing with the same data and using that same data. Um, the piece that will set you apart from the other businesses is the relationship. Um, how are you presenting yourself? Uh, what is your reputation? Uh, are you attending the events? Are you shaking the hands? Are you there when you say you're going to, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The government is risk averse, so you want to make sure that you are, in fact, uh, making it easy for them to find you. Uh, but there's going to be no silver bullet here in government contracting or in life in general. Uh, it's just something that you have to do day in, day out, and have grit. So uh, as far as federal marketing, and we continue the, the conversation here, if you understand uh, who your customer is and you can learn as much as possible about them, uh, for example, by signing up for Google News Alerts, um, uh, reading even just uh, the local paper here, the Washington Post, uh, but also federal publications such as GovExec, Federal News Network, um, Defense One. There's a host of uh, federal uh, government publications that will keep you abreast of what your potential customer is doing, what the issues are that they face, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, once you then get to the department or agency website, uh, typically they will have a newsletter that's going to be found maybe in the public affairs um, office. If you hop over to the small business office within that department or agency, that's where you're going to find the procurement forecast. You're going to find the industry days, kind of their open houses that they have, um, as well as any matchmaking events or any events that they may or uh, may be attending. So make sure that you are there because again, that's where the relationships matter and that's really the, the special sauce here. Um, continuing on with federal marketing, um, and this does kind of tie, this will tie back to the GSA schedule because you will, if you have a GSA schedule, you'll then have a digital presence because your uh, price list will be posted uh, publicly, digitally. So make sure that uh, your website and your LinkedIn, um, that you do have a presence there that speaks to federal contracting, that it uses the verbiage and vernacular that the federal government, um, particularly the agency or department that you're targeting, uh, uses. Uh, are you plugged into the associations? Are you involved? Are you volunteering for various committees? Are you attending networking events? Um, does your capability statement speak to any contract vehicles or designations that you have, um, as well as truly your capabilities? Um, the designations are really the cherry on top, the government is really looking uh, for someone that is capable and qualified uh, to execute contracts. On the marketing side, uh, you can still continue on here with uh, looking at how you are branding your company, the advertising and sponsoring. Is it easy for the government to find you? Uh, is your logo showing up in publications that they are reading? Does that then give them a sense of security, knowing that they see you wherever they go at events and benchmaking events, et cetera. 
Okay, um, and there are three uh, givens here, uh, typically within solicitations, but even just in conversations uh, and kind of what you're bringing, uh, presenting to the government or even potential partners. The capability, again, that's kind of your value prop. What are you doing and doing really well? What are you known for in the industry? Uh, don't try to be everything to everybody. Uh, your price needs to be competitive. And if you're playing the game of your business is offering the lowest price, then the GSA schedule is absolutely for you. Um, if your prices uh, tend to be on the higher side and you're more uh, providing a, um, a higher value to government clients, uh, GSA schedule may not be the right uh, marketing tool for you. And we'll talk about why uh, in a moment. Um, your past performance, uh, the longer you're in the game of federal contracting, the more that you're going to have. If you've done anything with state, local education, um, government uh, sectors, then that can be uh, relevant as well, as well as commercial or any subcontracting. Um, but this is, these are components of how you are presenting yourself and the, um, the more clear and concise and effective you can present your capabilities, your price and your past performance. Uh, the easier it is to market your business. Uh, contract vehicles, what are they? Uh, for those that don't know, it's more or less, I'll call it a vendor shortlist. So uh, a smaller set of eyeballs that are looking at uh, procurement uh, opportunities. And those are based again on those three givens that we talked about on that last slide. Uh, the set aside certifications, those are reserved for small businesses. This is going to be the women owned, veteran owned, hub zone, 8A, uh, SDVO, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those can certainly help. Uh, some will have, um, uh, you know, the, everything's going to have a pro and con to it, and it's not a cookie cutter uh, answer here. Um, same thing for contract vehicles. But again, uh, I'm just going to hone in here on the relationships, and that's really what, uh, what it comes down to, that relationships do matter because it's unique to you and your business. So what is a GSA schedule? Um, it's a contract vehicle or a marketing tool. It's absolutely not required. Don't let anybody tell you that you need this to sell to the government, uh, unless it's your customer that says, we really prefer to purchase from you through the schedule. You need to get on this. Otherwise, um, you know, my hands are tied and I'm, I'm not going to be able to, uh, to purchase from you. So keep that in mind. Don't let a, uh, a consulting firm or, or somebody tell you that you need this. Again, it's optional um, and it's used by about 18 to 20,000 companies, uh, most of which have zero sales through their schedule. So about 63% are not doing any business through their schedule. So either they have the build it and they will come. Um, strategy, which does not work, um, or somebody sold them something that uh, they don't uh, need or their customers don't prefer to use. Um, it can be used across all of uh, the entire federal government, also state, local, and education market. Um, there are some state and local governments that can use the GSA schedule. Uh, when I mentioned here quasi-government entities, that's going to be the World Bank, the IMF, the IFC, the Red Cross, United Nations. Uh, these sort of entities, they have the ability to purchase off of the schedule, but it's not required. Um, the main focus of, and the, again, specifically the GSA schedule will be your capabilities, the past performance, so uh, where do you have experience, um, and then your price. And price is about 99% of the focus here. And again, if your angle on federal contracting is offering uh, the lowest pricing or the lowest game in town, then GSA is going to serve you well. Um, if you're more on kind of the value um, uh, proposition side, uh, GSA may be something that you want to pause and reconsider. It is, in fact, a contract with terms and conditions. You're going to need to bring in at least $25,000 per year through your schedule. Um, so as I mentioned, it is a multiple award schedule, meaning there are multiple awards to multiple companies. Again, 18 to 20,000 companies hold the schedule, most of which have no sales through their schedule. Now they may have millions of dollars in federal contracts, but perhaps not through the GSA schedule. As you start downloading the data that we mentioned that's available to anybody with an internet connection, and you look at who is selling the same product services or software as you are, going to have a spreadsheet with a company name and the number of uh, and the dollars that they've done through their schedule. If you sort that Excel spreadsheet by dollar amounts, most of the rows are going to have a big fat zero next to them. 
the ones that do have revenue through them will be very minimal uh, revenue. And then the bulk of the work is being done by the top 20% of the vendors. Um, it's obviously going to vary, um, but my the takeaway here is be very cautious about going uh, down the route of getting a schedule. Um, the homework is really something you should do up front. So if you've gotten the schedule because you think it's the greatest uh, tool in town, the greatest marketing tool in town, and now you're starting your marketing game, you've done it completely backwards, in my opinion. Um, so back to schedules and really what they are, they are segmented by uh, what it is your solution is. They have something called special item numbers, SIN numbers. There's over 300 of them. Uh, sometimes they correspond to your NAICS code, but they will further identify what it is you're offering. So all of the vendors are on the GSA schedule, and then your differentiator is the special item number that, um, that you hold, again, that ident further identifies what it is you're offering. Uh, it is one of many contract vehicles. So the Navy has something called Seaport E. NASA has something called SOUP. DHS, Homeland Security, has something called EAGLE. And I can go through the list of federal departments and some of the agencies even that have their own contract vehicle. GSA just does a great job of marketing themselves. So don't think that just because you're on this that suddenly uh, your phone's going to be ringing off the hook or you're going to be getting orders left and right. It does not work that way. Uh, and it's really only used uh, roughly about 12% of the time in federal purchases. That's a small percentage, but it still represents billions of dollars. Again, there are many other contract vehicles that are out there. Make sure that when you pursue a contract vehicle or a set aside, uh, that you're doing it based on data and research that you've done before. Um, so a lot of times companies will ask us, um, you know, should I get the schedule because I don't have any other mechanism for the government to purchase from me. Um, I'm not, I don't qualify for any of the set-asides. Um, that's fine. You don't absolutely need a GSA schedule. You can respond to full and open um, competition awards. These are anything that you see on SAM.gov. These are going to be contracts that are valued at $25,000 or more uh, that are required to be posted on SAM.gov. As long as you meet the requirements of the solicitation, you can go ahead and respond. You don't need this GSA schedule. Um, you might need another contract vehicle. Um, so again, a lot of times companies are wondering, well, if I don't have the schedule, how do I get a contract? Um, and, and vice versa. So what comes first, the chicken or the egg? Um, so again, the market research, uh, in my opinion, really should be before you decide to get the schedule. Um, you should then be out there going to events, talking to your prospects, um, and understanding is the GSA even their preferred method of purchase. If you're talking to somebody again at DHS, they may say, no, you need to get on the Eagle contract, or you're talking to somebody at Navy, they may say you need to get on to uh, Seaport E or whatever it is. Um, so don't, don't go down the path because it will cost you time, effort, and money even if you do it yourself, to find that there is no return on your investment. Um, and that last line kind of speaks to that of, um, hey, let's just get the schedule and see what happens. It doesn't uh, really, that won't serve you well. Mm -hmm. So again, use the data that's out there, conduct the research, and most importantly, how do they purchase GSA or one of the many, many other contract vehicles. Let's say you've done that and you've done your homework, uh, you've got your spreadsheets, you know who your uh, customer is, you've had conversations with them, you've got a sales pipeline of opportunities that once you're on the schedule, you can go back and kind of tap these uh, organiz federal organizations and say, hey, we're on the schedule now. Um, but uh, so you're on the schedule, it's got a heartbeat and your prices are listed on the GSA schedule. Keep in mind that your prices, again, on the schedule have been negotiated down to more or less your lowest prices, plus the average of the other companies on the schedule who are also selling similar products or services or software. Um, at that point, you've got a, a pretty low rate, and as you start bidding for work through your schedule, you're going to bid below your GSA rate. So those are a price ceiling or a not to exceed rate. Um, Again, as I mentioned, you've got then these pipeline of opportunities and you should go back to those individuals and organizations to let them know you're on the schedule. Um, that's kind of where the easy part comes in if you've done your homework upfront. 
So some advantages of being on the schedule, it's just a smaller set of eyeballs looking at the opportunities. Let's say the circle uh, enclosed there by B is everything that you see on SAM.gov. Um, and then everything that you see in A then would be uh, the GSA schedule opportunities. So there's still gonna be a relationship that was in place with the buyer in both of these um, occasions, uh, something that has been worked uh, what I say worked and wired uh, for the last probably nine to if not 24 months in some cases. Um, and basically the companies have steered the buyer to um, to set the contract uh, aside for a GSA schedule purchase. So it still potentially is going to have some eyeballs looking at it. Um, in fact, the competition will be smaller, but it will be more qualified competition. So keep this in mind again before you get onto the schedule. Um, but some advantages are that, again, it will box out some of the competition, some of the folks that really shouldn't even be bothering to respond. Um, but it does give the government the uh, security because, again, they're risk averse. So they're going to know that your company has been vetted, that you do have that past performance, uh, that your pricing is negotiated down to basically the lowest rate, that you're competitive with the other companies on the schedule. So then it allows them to make that direct award to your business. Uh, it shows also that you're serious about the market, but if you're going after uh, the GSA schedule, simply just to have this feather in your cap because it looks good um, and gives the buyer confidence in you, it's probably, again, not going to serve you well. You should have some conversations that you have, some relationships and opportunities in your pipeline. Um, Pricing is published, uh, so on both the GSA Advantage website, uh, GSA eLibrary, and ebuy.gsa.gov, you can look at your competitors and look at their pricing to determine, is this contract vehicle going to be in my best interest? Am I going to be able to get my prices within a couple percentage points of my competitors? Um, if yes, and you think you then can be on the schedule and bid for opportunities at a little bit lower than your GSA rates, which again are a price ceiling. Um, and again, the, your, your angle is uh, your pricing game and you, you're kind of the, the low guy in town, then GSA will probably work wonders for you. Uh, if you're not, then you're probably gonna have some hurdles like 80% of the companies on the schedule. Um, so again, conduct that research up front. Um, GSA eBuy is one of the sites where uh, once you're on the schedule, you sign up for the RFP notifications and buyers um, from all over the federal government can look for your company, look for your product, service, or software, and send notifications to the companies that hold this special item number, so similar um, products and services as you, and you'll get these RFP notifications. Uh, again, typically what has happened here on GSA eBuy is a company or companies have been in there talking to the prospect, meaning the federal government, and have steered that prospect to, um, to go the route of GSA schedule so that a smaller set of eyeballs is looking at the RFP so that there's less competition. So as you start bidding on these and you're, you're saying, wow, we're bidding on all these, but we haven't won anything. Uh, my question is, did you have a relationship uh, with the buyer? Did you know this was going to be coming out on GSA eBuy? Uh, it's the same process and methodology as if you saw something on SAM.gov. If you're seeing it for the first time, you think it was written for you, but you don't have a relationship, it probably was not written for you. So um, you need to decipher what is, um, what is a good opportunity and what is not. Um, GSA Advantage uh, is going to be used more for the, the software and the product companies to uh, do some market research on pricing. Um, and GSA Advantage is where your price list will be posted. So uh, the buyers, meaning the federal government, can go there to look for your, uh, your company. That's a requirement to have your price list posted. Uh, but that is not, that's just, you know, not even half of the battle. It's maybe 5% of the battle. Um, again, it really comes down to the relationship. So let's just, because the, the data is really the most important uh, piece here when it comes to marketing, because once you um, narrow down your focus of who your prospect is and how they purchase and you've determined that, yes, it is through the schedule, um, 
you, you're using this data to kind of reverse engineer and then you've determined that, yes, our, our, our buyers do prefer the GSA schedule and that's why we got onto that contract vehicle. Um, and it's really this, um, this data piece, the homework, the research is really the most important component. Otherwise, you're just in a knee-jerk uh, reaction to solicitations that you see on SAM.gov. Um, a lot of this is um, repetitive of what I've said. So looking again at um, GSA scheduled data, you can look at uh, pricing of competitors, award data, look at the trends. And I would suggest, uh, particularly where we are now in uh, closing out fiscal year 2023, going back at least five fiscal years. Typically, I would say three, maybe even four. Uh, but five to six, I think, would be ideal simply because of COVID, because you're going to see spikes as well as drops for certain um, products and services that the government purchased during those uh, COVID contracting um, periods. So obviously, healthcare, you're going to see spikes that maybe we didn't see in the fiscal years leading up to COVID. And then uh, it remains to be seen what will be happening in these kind of post-COVID uh, years things may level out again. So if you're just looking at data from the COVID contracting period to now, I think that's um, an inaccurate uh, view. You do need to go back further to get a full picture and make better decisions. Okay, um, again, assuming that uh, the folks on the line who actually do have the schedule uh, were wise enough to conduct this research and uh, determine that yes, the schedule is how my customer prefers to purchase, um, then the, the rest is really um, easy. So leveraging the schedule, it's kind of this if and then, um, as I mentioned. So um, your prospect then becomes a customer because that was the piece that was holding them back was they didn't have a way to purchase from you and they explicitly said, we prefer to use the GSA schedule or this opportunity is going to be going out through the schedule. Um, that's really where the, the conversion comes in. So again, if you've conducted that research, you've built a relationship, um, that, that next kind of marketing piece is easy. Um, so there, there's really, again, no silver bullet or, or special sauce here for marketing, um, but there are some things that you, you can do, which we're gonna talk about uh, momentarily. So uh, again, the government will, if they're asking you, how can I get to you? Um, I, I, there's not a contract vehicle in place. You don't have a, uh, a contract vehicle. Uh, when you hear that, that is, I would say, uh, bells and whistles should be going off and this prospect then is becoming a hot prospect and it's giving you the impetus then and the kind of push to then to get onto the schedule. Uh, I wouldn't rely just on one prospect. I would make sure you've got a pipeline full of multiple organizations, multiple people that prefer to use the schedule to get to you. Um, what it does for the buyer is it makes uh, the process so much easier uh, in these days and everything that we do, there is so much paperwork, uh, particularly in um, anything related to the government, whether you're, you're shipping a package or um, sending certified mail or, uh, or selling to the government or renewing a, a driver's license. Um, so anytime somebody can reduce uh, the paperwork for you, which is what the GSA schedule word will do, um, it makes it easier for the buyer. Um, they also know that your prices have been compared to the other companies on the schedule, and they know that they're getting your absolutely lowest price. Um, because again, they're risk averse, your past performance has been reviewed, and your capabilities, you're basically um, vetted as far as uh, being able to provide what you say you can. Um, please note that uh, particularly service companies, you're still gonna need to write proposals uh, in response to GSA schedule solicitations. Um, product companies, not as much, and that's just um, just a fact. Uh, but again, the relationship is really where uh, where it happens, where where the magic happens, where you're you're going to seal the deal. Um, also, if you have a contract that's not on the schedule, and let's say it started out as something kind of small, maybe a ten thousand dollar purchase years ago, and now it's coming up to like twenty five thousand dollars, and the government's saying, okay, now it's going to be at twenty five thousand. We're going to have to put this on Sam.gov. Um, you can help steer that customer to purchasing from you through the schedule where it would not have to be posted on SAM, where it's just then a direct award to your business without any other eyeballs seeing it. Um, and so if the government is satisfied with your performance, uh, it helps kind of facilitate that relationship and helps 
uh, help steer the opportunity, the solicitation through the schedule. Um, and as I mentioned, yes, proposals still need to be written. So really what you're doing by being on the schedule is making it easier for the government to purchase from you. Um, again, they know that, uh, that you've been vetted and, and cleared more or less. And I don't mean cleared as in a security clearance. I just mean that you're, you're cleared, you know, they know that you know what you're doing and what you're offering you've offered in the past successfully. Uh, just some basics here. If you do have the schedule, make sure that it's easy for the buyers to know that you've got the schedule. So there should be something very profound on your website that has the GSA logo. This is uh, absolutely allowed and encouraged. And that should link over to your GSA price list, which shows up on GSA Advantage. Don't make them click through um, five pages or you know trying to scroll to, through your website to find, you know, does this company even sell to the government? It looks like most of their stuff is commercial. Make it very easy for them to understand that you do sell to the government and that you've got a mechanism, a GSA schedule, a uh, methodology for them to get to you. The GSA logo, I'd put it on the back of your business card along with your schedule number and your uh, SIC, uh, SIN numbers. Um, it should be on your capability statement. It should be on your auto signature and your all of your emails. Again, with a link to your price list. QR codes can also work well here, um, particularly on your capability statement uh, for those that are still um, carrying those around. Um, on your LinkedIn business profile, maybe you add uh, into the description there um, a link to your GSA schedule pricing. We now have, I think it's two to three million feds on LinkedIn. They do use it, businesses use it, prime contractors use it. Um, uh, the departments and agencies are posting uh, news. They're posting information about the webinars that they're hosting. They're posting information about matchmaking events. So they will also conduct their market research as part of the FAR using LinkedIn. So again, if they go to your company page and there's not, you don't have a logo there, you don't have a link to your website, you don't have a short description, you don't have the people in your company uh, listed as employees and tied to your LinkedIn company page, you're not gonna look professional. Um, so again, make sure that these kind of small minor things are all kind of tidied up uh, and it will give you a more professional appearance, uh, which really helps in kind of that marketing um, business development capture uh, process. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, and then once you've got the schedule, you wanna notify any partners, any teaming partners. Uh, if you're part of a mentor protege program or a joint venture, um, or, or your business is potentially gonna be for sale, this could be very attractive for mergers and acquisitions. Uh, your prospects, uh, obviously there's gonna be the government folks, and then just people on your network. So if your company has a newsletter, um, you know, I don't know that this is worthy of a press release, but, um, but just notifying them that uh, you are on the schedule. Make it easy for people to know that you're on there and make it easy for uh, people to then find what it is you're selling and at what price, and is it easy to find a contact name and phone number for you. Some conclusions here, uh, it really does come down to the relationship. Uh, I couldn't resist a little uh, Cary Grant here uh, today on a, a Thursday, um, but you really do need a relationship in place for your GSA schedule to be successful. Uh, without that, you're really just a name and a number along with the other 18 to 20,000 companies on the schedule. Um, the relationship, that person to person, that human to human contact uh, is really where it's at. Um, and if we're using this analogy of, you know, a, a guy in a sports car trying to, to get a gal uh, to go out with him, you may be the best looking guy, the car may be a, a red convertible, um, and, and you're wearing the right clothes and the right sunglasses and everything else, um, but if you're just kind of an empty suit, that's not going to help. You're still going to need substance. So um, that... And that substance kind of plays into the relationship and your, your past performance and your, your capabilities. Um, so really what I'm saying here is that the, the real sale takes place outside of the schedule and the, the schedule is really just a mechanism to simplify this whole acquisition process. 
Um, as I mentioned a couple of times, if you're, you're playing the low game on price, then GSA schedule is, uh, will serve you well. Um, but uh, the most important thing is really don't get onto the schedule and then start marketing. It really happens uh, in, the, um, in the opposite direction that marketing and, and capture and research process happens first. That's really where the bulk of your time and effort should be spent to make sure that everything that happens after that um, helps facilitate, again, that purchasing process. Um, and I'll stop here and answer any questions. Um, and again, thanks everybody for sticking with us through the technical uh, difficulties. No, and I appreciate you, Jennifer, as well, uh, coming back online and, and that. And just uh, one note about uh, recordings and slides, there's a couple of questions about that. The full recording will be pieced together and, uh, and sent out after the webinar and available on demand. Um, so there is a Q&A box underneath the presentation. So if you put in questions directly to us and we'll, we'll try and get through them. Um, just initially, Jennifer, uh, you noted about LinkedIn, social media being um, kind of a value resource to, um, to organizations. Some people probably find that a bit surprising, like, you know, but what, what are your main, what are the main goals when you are trying to create a LinkedIn profile for this kind of scenario? Sure. So LinkedIn, uh, at least for your, your kind of personal, professional profile, not your business, um, you should be wearing uh, professional clothes. Your background should either dictate something about federal contracting um, or it should just be a plain background. This shouldn't be your your Christmas card or your family vacation with your children or your spouse or uh, your latest um, uh, vacation. Um, it should speak um, it should just be professional. It should be a clear photo, um, easy to see that you are, are serious about your business and that sort of thing. That's my opinion. Um, and then uh, make sure that you have all of your experience. Uh, any recommendations are always helpful. Any publications, whether it's white papers, YouTube videos, uh, links to all of those can certainly be um, helpful. Uh, your business profile, um, you should have your company logo, and that should be listed again back on kind of your personal uh, LinkedIn page uh, where you have your um, your work experience your your first company then should be listed there with the logo and then you should have a company page um, if your company has a newsletter or you're attending any conferences or events you can start posting some things there but um, I'll tell you truthfully I have LinkedIn open uh, pretty much 24 7 on my um, computer that's it's where things happen and like I said about two to three million feds Federal government employees are on LinkedIn. The small businesses offices within the federal department are very, very active on LinkedIn. You'll find out about events, uh, notices, places where they're gonna be speaking that maybe aren't listed on the department website. So um, stay abreast of, of those. Yeah, it can, al it can almost be a, a more live, um, people update LinkedIn faster than they will those websites. So if you want to get in quickly it often you'll find that information a bit quicker on linkedin or social media um so it's definitely definitely a, a good point we've actually heard that more and more jennifer when we ask for like customers to give advice or for like consultants to give advice they always point towards social media and using it a bit more than maybe people are used to um to kind of benefit themselves so that was a great point um i do have one question um you, you mentioned about doing analysis of um, previous contracts or looking back into the COVID era. era and if, that's really interesting. I just thought in general that that is, and your analysis in terms of COVID spiking it is, is really interesting. Do you have any other tips around that type of analysis or a little bit more detail about how you do that or, or, or tips along the way? Yeah, I mean, uh, the federal government market is so unique. So again, you've got the, the SAM.gov, FPDS, Federal right. Procurement Data System, USA Spending, um, and then you've got specific um, tools within GSA and even other um, uh, department websites where you can uh, extract data on companies, whether it's their pricing or et cetera. Um, so that is really what should drive your should be built into your business plan. It should drive your strategy. You should use data to make decisions about where and how you're going to spend your time and effort. 
um, even to determine is the GSA schedule right for you. Um, so again, no magic bullet here on, on really how to market the schedule, uh, but if you've done that marketing and homework correctly up front, um, this webinar you wouldn't even need because um, you did something correct where you've got a pipeline of opportunities and now you're just circling back to Joe Smith at Department of Commerce who said, hey, I wanna buy from you through the schedule and somebody at Department of Ag said the same thing. Now you've got the schedule and, um, and so it, it markets itself if you've done that homework correctly. Yeah, very good. Um, a question from um, Sanda. Um, and you definitely did touch on it a little bit, but maybe you might have some more um, more detail to give, Jennifer. But um, how do you advise to build relationships with contracting personnel in the government? Yep. So again, uh, making it easy for them. Thank you for the question. Um, so I think making it easy for them to find you. Uh, again, LinkedIn, your uh, business website um, should speak um, easily speak to federal contracting. Um, there should be no question when they go to your website, is this company even a government contractor? How do I contact somebody in uh, the federal sales sector if I wanna buy their widget or if I'm interested in learning more about their uh, services? You should have a capability statement that's easily downloadable, um, that again has any contract vehicles or certifications that you have, um, attending the associations uh, that these folks are uh, involved in, uh, going to the matchmaking events that are put on by your PTEX and APEX accelerators and SBA offices and, uh, and all the rest, reading the news publications to find out who's who within the agency and, um, and just again, using data to chart your path forward. Um, GovEvents.com is a great platform just to find events related to government contracting. Um, and that's uh, a good way to kind of get out there and start shaking some hands. But first and foremost, I would say associations. Um, you're going to have different associations. You're going to have associations for um, women-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, 8A firms. Um, you're going to have just general government contracting associations. You're going to have industry-specific associations related to IT or whatever your product is. Um, you're gonna have associations for, uh, for example, APMP and NCMA. APMP is Association of Proposal Management Professionals. Um, they have a chapter in every state, if not more. Same thing with NCMA, National Contract Management Association. They're gonna have a chapter in every state, if not more. Um, and a lot of times um, you'll find some government folks there. Um, they're not gonna be the large majority of the attendees, but, um, but you will uh, find their presence there. Very good. Um, a question in relation to kind of pricing um, from David. How much should a company discount their schedule of pricing when it is time to bid on a contract? So when you are sending a proposal to GSA to get onto the schedule, uh, you're re there's two litmus tests that uh, the government conducts. One is your internal uh, pricing, which is what discounts have you given to any of your other customers? and then GSA will want something that's equal to or better than those lower discounts. Uh, the second is um, how does your pricing, your proposed pricing to GSA compare to the other vendors on the schedule? Then they come up with a number, you either accept it or counter offer, and then, um, and then there's acceptance of, we'll say the final price, that's your GSA price. Now, once you're on the schedule, you are encouraged to give discounts lower than your GSA rate. So, um, so that's why I'm saying if you're in the in the game, if your angle in uh, in your business is that you just offer the cheapest price and, and that, that works well for you and you're profitable doing that, then GSA will work very well for you. Um, hopefully I answered the question. If not, uh, please uh, rephrase or retype it. No, that's great. And I'd imagine it it can be a little bit competitive in terms of pricing on the GSA. Do you find, is GSA anyway unique in terms of pricing, in terms of that type of world of discounts or the way, way an organization should price? Right, well, GSA is very aggressive during the negotiation. So as you're sending in your proposal to get onto the schedule, they're going to ask for deeper discounts, again, based on those two litmus tests that I mentioned. 
Um, they will also ask for volume discounts and prompt payment discounts. So the pricing that you see if you're, when you are conducting your market research of your competitors uh, is really going to be the lowest price that GSA negotiated them down to. Um, so keep in mind, let's say they're selling a widget at $100 just to use a round number. As your competitor, let's say you are also on the schedule and your rate is also 100 or maybe you're at 99 or $101 uh, and a solicitation comes out and there's, let's say, 100 vendors in your special item number. So 100 vendors are seeing this opportunity uh, and the average price is $100. Most people, most companies, if they bid on that work, are going to be encouraged to bid at a rate lower than that $100. No, very good. Um, Jennifer, thank you so much. This has been great. Do you have any final words or any, any final comments that you'd like to give to the group? I know if I'll say it for the 101st time is really if you have conducted that market research up front, uh, the schedule will simply, uh, it'll, it'll operate itself more or less as a marketing tool for you. Um, because uh, you've determined, you've done the homework to determine that that is how your prospects purchase, and it's going to then uh, be easy for them to purchase from you. But it's not for everybody, so choose wisely. It's one of many contract vehicles. Uh, if, in fact, you need help with that determination, that is a service that we provide um, as far as you know, looking at other contract vehicles and mechanisms by which the government purchases from you. You can also conduct this yourself by uh, navigating through all of the various websites that are out there. Um, should you have determined that the schedule is something your company wants to pursue, we can uh, assist you with that. Uh, and as you mentioned earlier in the program, we do have a newsletter. It's free. It goes out every Monday. Um, and so feel free to sign up for that. It's on our website at the top right hand corner. Um, and it has uh, good content and links to various webinars that are um, all free that we provide. No, oh, that's fantastic. Jennifer, thank you so much for your time. For all those who joined us on the new link, thank you so much. The slides and recordings will be sent after the webinar. Um, please do subscribe to Jennifer's uh, newsletter. It's full of impactful information. We're delighted to say Jennifer will be back later in the year to, to support us on another webinar. Um, so that webinar is in actually October, um, capitalizing on FY24 federal contracts to get us ahead of the new financial year. That's going to be really timely. So that's certainly one to look out for. Um, all the content and links that were mentioned in today's session will be sent afterwards, and we're delighted to, to welcome you here today. So thank you so much. So. Great. Thanks, everybody.